What we don't understand at this point is exactly how and why they, they're formed. Every cloud droplet that's formed is formed on a particle initially in the air. And so it's absolutely crucial to understand how these particles come about and what their properties are. Otherwise, we can't ever hope to understand clouds uh, and, and their behavior. And that's where cosmic rays actually might come in. Because what do cosmic rays do when they enter the Earth's atmosphere? They produce small ions. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, so it is the belief that these small charges help forming these small specks or aerosols in the Earth's atmosphere. Whereas most people would think that since there's water in the atmosphere, that naturally there'll be clouds, but that isn't true. The only way that clouds can form in the atmosphere, in our atmosphere, under normal conditions, is to condense onto an aerosol or existing particle in the air. Every cloud droplet that's formed is formed on a particle initially in the air. All clouds are formed upon these aerosols. And so it's absolutely crucial to understand how these particles come about and what their properties are. Otherwise, we can't ever hope to understand clouds uh, and, and their behavior. In science, it's not enough just to have a good theory. You also need some experiments to support the ideas. I was very determined to get an experiment that could show that we had this connection between cosmic rays, aerosol formation, and clouds. What I'm going to talk about is cosmic rays. These are particles, are very energetic particles, they enter the Earth's atmosphere and we can actually measure them. So when we have maximum activity, you see that there's not so many cosmic rays coming in to the Earth's uh, atmosphere. That's because now the Sun has a very strong magnetic field and it's difficult for the particles that come from the uh, galactic space to get into uh, the solar system. So there seems to be an uh, agreement between uh, changes uh, in solar activity and changes in climate. So what is really needed is some experimental uh, evidence that can say yes or no whether such a relation, I mean, how, how does it really work? That is what is needed. And it's very fortunate that uh, such an experiment seem, is, uh, looks like will be uh, performed. I, I would like to say I think the experiment is completely misconceived and shows a complete lack of elementary knowledge about uh, how clay, the clouds behave. So whichever way you look at it, that experiment is completely misconceived and will tell you nothing about what happens in the atmosphere. Well, I, to I totally disagree, but I should say that the people that are involved there are people that are experts in uh, aerosols and, uh, and atmospheric uh, chemistry, so they, they, they know what they're doing. So, and I, I know, I mean, they, they, they will disagree with your, your point of view, but it, it, it's true there are different uh, views, but you are one extreme, I would say. <laughs> I've many times given talks uh, where people have got very excited and very strongly trying to tell me that what I was doing was completely waste of time. You read my book? Well, I know of your book. Well, well, there you are then. You shouldn't argue with me on cloud physics. <laughs> no, the whole thing is a complete misconception. Not a single one has come up with anything from a scientific point of view that made me think that there was not something, a real scientific question worth pursuing. So, I mean, you know, what's the point of doing that experiment? Well, there's been written several papers where they discuss where 
where do the cloud condensation nuclei actually come from? How are they formed? Oh, we know that. No, it's not known, according to these persons. Oh, my God, well, they just must read the literature. They're... I had this theory, so I decided that we should do an experiment in Copenhagen that could show whether my idea was right or wrong. Unfortunately, it turned out to be much more difficult than I thought it would be. I mean, I actually started this without having no funds at all. And I just continued hoping that we would get money at some point. Building the laboratory, building the experiment, getting the funds, it actually took almost four years. The idea in this experiment is to investigate what is the role of cosmic rays. And the idea is that we, in the end, will be able to mimic the processes that are going on in the real atmosphere. So this whole chamber is built in such a way that we can control ions inside it. And uh, we will be able to reveal for the first time how important ions are in the production of forming new aerosols and then in the end, new clouds. The motivation for doing this experiment has uh, really been uh, trying to understand why there seems to be this relation between solar activity and climate on Earth. All this uh, political turmoil that is surrounding uh, global warming and so on is irrelevant for the, uh, the science. And the kind of experiment that we are doing, I think it's a necessary uh, experiment because it will uh, improve our understanding on one of the most important processes in the atmosphere, which is uh, cloud formation. Originally, I got interested uh, in the topic when a colleague of mine uh, in Germany asked me what are the effects of supernovae on life on Earth. And I decided to give him a serious answer. Uh, what I did, I uh, looked at uh, the literature and eventually uh, stumbled upon uh, Henrik Svensmark uh, results about uh, cosmic rays and cloud cover. So I realized that uh, if this uh, hypothesis is correct, that uh, cosmic rays affect cloud cover and climate, what it would mean is that also uh, variations which don't originate from the sun, but also variations from the whole Milky Way, they too will affect climate on Earth. Ever since I was a kid, I was uh, interested in astronomy. That's why I became an astronomer. I never realized as a kid, I mean, I always appreciated uh, this Milky Way, the fact that you can go out in a dark uh, night and see this beautiful uh, galaxy that we're inside of. It is something that we actually live in. It's part of us and it's affecting us. It's affecting uh, climate here on Earth. And you must take it into uh, account, into consideration, if you want to understand past variations uh, in the climate. What's fascinating is that this Milky Way, which looks something which is very far away, it isn't very far away. We are part of it. And this link between this Milky Way and us is cosmic rays. The solar system moves in and out of the spiral arms. And the spiral arms are the regions where you have the new stars. And the new stars is also some of them, the heavy stars that clip very shortly and explode in supernova. That means that you have more cosmic rays as you move in to the um, uh, spiral arms. If we look at the Milky Way from the top, what we'll see are four spiral arms, and that's because the Milky Way is a spiral arm galaxy. So we have small, four spiral arms. We are located here on some small armlet. We are rotating around the sun once every year, but the whole solar system rotates around the Milky Way once every about 250 million years. That's one galactic year. What this means is that every 150 million years, when you pass through a spiral arm of the galaxy, it's colder by uh, something of order 5 degrees or 10 degrees. When we're outside of the spiral arm, it's hot. 
Now we're on this uh, small spur, so we're witnessing cold weather. When we enter a spiral arm of the galaxy, we are going to witness more uh, cosmic rays reaching the Earth, more atmospheric ionization, more uh, cloud condensation nuclei, and therefore more low altitude clouds, or to be more uh, precise, whiter low altitude clouds, which better reflect the sunlight and cool the Earth. So the bottom line is that when we enter a spiral arm of the galaxy, we should expect lower temperatures. 